So let's imagine the things that we consume, those macronutrients like carbohydrates and lipids and proteins, are represented by this block of Lego here. We need the individual pieces to, to build our own tissues or to drive energetic processes within the body. And if I needed to break these down, I guess I, I could go piece by piece by hand, but that would be fairly time consuming. Now, you Brickmasters know that LEGO has a tool to help us break apart these pieces fairly easily. Now, in the body, there's a similar type of tool. It's a biological molecule that we refer to as an enzyme. And enzymes allow the body to go through the process of digestion a lot faster than it would without. In fact, we talked about the process of digestion taking a day or two or three, and without these enzymes, this process could take weeks or even months if they occurred at all. So enzymes are extremely important for us in order to have the breakdown of the macronutrients that we need to occur on a timely basis, and not only that, on a timely basis as it proceeds through the digestive system. Now, some of these enzymes are produced along the way in some of the tissues or organs that the food actually passes through, but most of them are produced elsewhere. And the organs that produce things for the digestive system, but that food and waste doesn't actually pass through, we refer to as accessory organs. And the first accessory organ that we see is in the mouth. Now, as you well know, if we smell food or see food or sometimes even talk about food, we begin to produce saliva, we begin to salivate. I mean, think about the images that you see in food advertisements and some of the language that they use, like mouth-watering. They're going right after that physiological response. They want your saliva to be produced. Those ad wizards know what they're doing. So let's say you wanted to mix up your own batch of saliva. You would probably start with water, because water is the main component of saliva, and it helps to not only sort of lubricate and mix up the food, but it helps in the process of tasting by dissolving some of the substances so they can be detected on the tongue. Uh, there is a mucus component to it, because again, it has to lubricate the food as it's being passed to the back of the mouth. But one of the things that you're going to find in there is an enzyme called amylase. Now, we've talked about the sort of derivation or the etymology of words before, and any time we see A-S-E at the end of something, that tells us that that substance is most likely an enzyme. And more specifically, the prefix for that enzyme name helps us figure out what it breaks down. So in the case of amylase, it breaks down amylose. And amylose, any time we see O-S-E, that probably tells us that we're dealing with a sugar, it is a rare, very long carbohydrate chain or polysaccharide that we more commonly call starch. So the amylase is there to begin the breakdown of food chemically by breaking down starch, or amylose, into simpler sugar units, or disaccharides. So while the first place in the digestive system the food encounters an enzyme is in the mouth, through the action of an accessory organ, the next place that we actually see the action of enzymes is not an accessory organ, it is in your stomach. So when food gets into the stomach, there is a hormone that's produced in the submucosa of the stomach that we refer to as gastrin. So the term hormone is given to something that was commonly called a chemical messenger. It's produced in one part of the body and travels typically through the bloodstream uh, or some other fluid means to act in another area in the body. So in our case, the hormone gastrin is used to signal the gastric cells lining the stomach to produce gastric juice. Now all of these gast or gastro prefix actually gives us a little bit of information about this stuff as well. The gastro prefix stems from the Greek for stomach. So anytime we hear gastrin or gastric juices or gastric cells, it's referring to those things that occur in and around or related to the stomach. Now one of the components of gastric juice is hydrochloric acid. And the presence of that hydrochloric acid lowers the pH of the stomach. Now, the lower pH or more acidic environment actually deactivates the amylase that comes from the mouth with the bolus of food as it enters into the stomach. Now, inactive forms of enzymes are referred to as zymogens. And anytime you see ogen on the end of something, that may indicate that you have a zymogen. So the zymogen that's produced in the stomach is pepsinogen. Now, it's an inactive form of a protease, that is an enzyme that breaks down proteins. And the reason that it's inactivated, or the reason that it's not active initially, is because it prevents autodigestion. Which sounds like a really efficient thing, but really it just means it prevents the stomach from eating itself. So when food comes into the stomach and the pH of the environment is lowered, that lower pH environment actually activates the pepsinogen to form pepsin, which is one of the enzymes that helps break down proteins in the body. 
So now the partially digested material, or chyme, moves from the stomach into the duodenum region of the small intestine. And as we've discussed already, this region of the small intestine is one of the primary locations of chemical digestion, so it stands to reason this is also one of the primary locations of enzymatic action in the digestive tract. And that is the case. And the organ that's involved the most in terms of this enzymatic action or releasing enzymes into this area of the digestive tract is the pancreas. Now the pancreas is kind of a flat, almost conical shaped uh, organ that's kind of sandwiched in between the stomach and the small intestine. And one of the first things that it does upon detection of food into the duodenum is to release bicarbonate ions. And these bicarbonate ions ultimately neutralize, or at least raise the pH of the environment by neutralizing some of the hydrogen chloride or acid that comes from the stomach. And by doing so, it creates an environment that is not ideal for the action of the pepsin. So this higher pH environment, or more basic or less acidic environment, deactivates the uh, pepsin coming from the stomach. But what it does do is serve to create conditions by which other enzymes start to work. So we encountered salivary amylase to break down carbohydrates in the mouth. But we also have some amylase here to further break down amylose or starch that's produced in the pancreatic juice. So we refer to this then as pancreatic amylase. In addition, we have trypsinogen, which is a zymogen, an inactive form of another protease that works best in a higher pH environment. So even though we get pepsin, which is deactivated by this more basic environment, we get the activation of trypsinogen into trypsin, which helps further break down some proteins. Now, in terms of fats, we haven't really talked about how they're broken down yet. And yes, there are some lipases that are going to be produced by the pancreas as well, but the problem with fats as they come into this region of the intestine is that they're in very large sort of globules, and it's very difficult for those lipases to break them down. So this is where another accessory organ comes in. So this big honking thing right here is your liver. I guess it's not your liver, but it's a representation of a liver. And the liver is an extremely important organ in the body, but I'm just going to focus on one particular aspect of it, and that's the one directly involved in the digestive process. And that is in the production of bile. Now, I've already talked about fats as they come into this region of the small intestine. They're just far too big and globular to break down effectively or efficiently. So bile acts to break these big fat globules down to smaller components called micelles. And these micelles can then be acted upon by the lipases to more efficiently and effectively break down the fats or the lipids. Now, if we take a bit of a closer look, we can see that there's this tiny little sac, and it's often sort of brownish colored or green colored, we refer to this as the gallbladder. And the gallbladder really is just sort of a storage post for the bile that's produced by the liver, and when food comes into the small intestine, this is probably the main source of the bile as it comes uh, to start to break down those fat globules. So in effect, to not put it too crudely, the digestive process is just in one end and out the other. But without the action of all of these enzymes from these different organs, most of them accessory organs within the body, the digestive process would not be fast enough, nor would it be efficient enough to get us all of the energy and nutrients and cellular components and tissue components that we need in order to survive. So my hope is, after watching this video, you have a better understanding of the locations of where enzymatic action occurs in the digestive system. You understand that enzymes require certain environments in order for them to work effectively, and that some environments will actually shut down the action of enzymes, that the body actually has some defense mechanisms in order to prevent auto-digestion or the body effectively eating itself, and that you appreciate without the action of enzymes that this whole digestive process would take a whole heck of a lot longer than it does now. So the next time you're eating, I want you to thank an enzyme for me, Mr. Key, and right now I'll thank you for watching.